Here at the Sofa Squad, we've covered a lot of different monsters, a lot of people who you can barely call people. A lot of them have some of the same characteristics, some of the same patterns, some of the same ruthless, inhumane actions that they carry out onto others. But there is one of them that sticks out to me in my memory that actually if you have been watching the sofa squad ever since it was just a little baby love seat back in the very beginning we actually did a book club on this guy and i use the word guy very lightly this monster still haunts me there is no rhyme or reason to what he did to inflict pain on others or to take from this world what he felt was his Today for this video, I want us to revisit the once living and walking nightmare, Israel Keys. He stole the lives of both known and unknown victims, the count we might not ever know. He would steal from the world to help facilitate his crimes and laugh in the face of justice. Today, we are going to be visiting who was once a walking and living nightmare, Israel Keys. Y'all, this ain't no drill. If you've got your sofa seatbelt, you need to go ahead and make sure it is fastened, okay? Because this case today, it ain't for the faint of heart, all right? Now, welcome back to the damn sofa, everybody. That's the damn sofa, and my sassy sidekick, Roscoe, is actually sitting right here on the floor next to me. He just jumped down, but that's okay. He'll be joining us back up there shortly. And if you don't know by now, my damn name's Paul. Now, I want to thank everybody who keeps the doors open here and those little seat cushions back there fluffed. I do appreciate it very much. This wouldn't be here without you. I wouldn't be able to make the amount of content that I do without you. So thank you from the bottom of my heart, from the bottom of Roscoe's heart, and from underneath the sofa cushion over there. I also have a couple of different channels. The links are all down in the description below, so be sure to check those out and subscribe to them if you aren't already. And go ahead and make some room on the sofa there behind me for our today's sponsor. Y'all give it up for today's guest on the sofa. A stressful time in our household is whenever we pack for a trip, little Roscoe knows that something is going on. Now what makes that even more stressful is when that trip is for the 4th of July. The fireworks are total sensory overload, the noise, the craziness, all of that stuff. Also for us, we are headed to the beach and we're going to be staying in our camper and it makes all of that 10 times worse. So when Cradle reached out to Roscoe and I, I was like, absolutely, we will totally try that. Look at the cute package that they sent us. So you're probably wondering, who is Cradle? Cradle is a dog supplement company focused on helping dogs live a stress-free life. Their mission is to create happier homes for families with pets through easy-to-use, easy-to-love, natural calming products that truly work. They have bundles of chews for 4th of July fireworks, road trips, separation, or any other stressful occasion. Cradle wants you and your dogs to both be happy. They have the all-day calming bone, cleans, bliss bar, chillers, all with or without CBD. Or chews, melts, only CBD. Non-CBD products are currently available at Walmart. Cradle's patent-pending Botanitech formulation is the backbone of their products. Botanitech is a proprietary blend of proven, pure, human-grade ingredients from some of the best places on Earth with natural flavoring and no artificial colors. And look, all the products are thoroughly tested for purity and potency with certificates of analysis fully transparent on their website. The CBD-based products contain broad-spectrum CBD from the highest quality American-grown hemp with no THC. And look, this is one thing that I really love about this company. Cradle is giving back to rescue heroes. They're giving back to animal shelters everywhere and making adoption easier for all. Cradle has partnered with incredible organizations across the country, providing free Cradle samples and calming adoption kits for pet parents to ease that transition into their forever homes. I absolutely love that. So one thing I really liked about this was their calming bliss bar that you see me opening here. So the packaging was awesome. They come wrapped up. Y'all, I'm not gonna lie, when I opened this, y'all, this smelled good, okay? I mean, I actually like lifted it up and 
smelled it. It smelled amazing. It was moist. It was soft. Roscoe, if you know, if you watch my channel, you know that Roscoe is an older dog. So he has gum issues, teeth issues, like he doesn't really have any. And I was worried about that. But one thing I love about Cradle is he was able to eat this, right? And I just broke it into little pieces with him. It was very easy to pick out how much he needed. And y'all, look at him sitting here eating this. He was like absolutely cool about it. Tried to grab it out of my hand. Tried to grab it out of my hand, the little sneaky thing. And so I was 100% sold on this. For 20% off your order of Cradle products, go to CradleMyPet.com, reporting live, and use promo reporting live at checkout. Order online before June 28th to receive by July 4th, or visit your local Walmart to see their line of calming supplements in person. Again, for 20% off your order of Cradle products, go to CradleMyPet.com, reporting live, and use promo reporting live at checkout. Order online before June 28th to receive by July 4th, or visit your local Walmart to see their line of calming supplements in person. Okay, so like I said, all the links are down in the description for them below. Go check them out. I think you're going to enjoy it. And I think your little fur babies will too. Rothko I know does. Anyways, let's go ahead and get going. So like I said, today we're going to be discussing the case of Israel Keys. In the very beginning of this channel, we did have a book club and we talked about the book that is the central point of, of research that I did for this video today. That book is called American Predator. The book is by Maureen Callahan. Now, I also looked into articles by publications such as All Things Interesting and taped interviews by the FBI, as well as some of their publications and articles on him as well. All those links and whatnot are down in the description below if you want to look into further viewing. And for this video, like I said, we're going to be discovering different aspects of the case that really just stuck out to me and that I felt I wanted to come here and to discuss with the Sofa Squad. Now, this could end up being a multi-part video. I'm not sure at the time of this recording, so just go ahead and be prepared. Okay, so who was Israel Keys? I felt like to really get to know him because he is very elusive, and that was the thing that was so eerie and scary about him, is no one ever really knew who he was. So to really try and get some form of a picture of him, I wanted to start back with where he came from, what his childhood was like, and really what his parents were like and who they were. So Israel himself was born in January of 1978. So he's pretty much my age. He's like one year younger than me actually, or would be at this point in time, right? Now his parents met as teens in Los Angeles. Um, they were be considered kind of like misfits, it sounded like when I was reading about them. Heidi was 21 years old, Jeff was 22. They were Mormons. So Heidi was adopted and it sounded like she preferred the company of adults. And she had been a Girl Scout for several years. Jeff had been a missionary in Germany. It sounded like they had like like, you know, similar, not similar, but you know, some similar qualities, experiences, that kind of a thing in their childhood and growing up that helped them to form this friendship, this bond between one another. Now they had both decided that they kind of wanted to like live off in the woods and do that kind of a lifestyle to raise their children. So this is what would prompt them to move to Utah. And they did so in 1976. Now they would soon thereafter have a daughter. Her name was America. Now after having America, they would decide that they were going to have all their children at home. These were the type of people they did not trust hospitals. They did not trust, you know, doctors uh, at all, right? This was like not their thing. Um, you know, Jeff hated hated doctors. Uh, he didn't like medicine. He had never been immunized. He didn't want any of his children to be immunized. None of the kids had birth certificates, social security cards, none of that, right? Uh, the kids never went to a doctor or a dentist or even really had Tylenol. So we're talking like living off the grid here, right? Now, eventually a neighbor would call the authorities on them and this would cause them to move to Washington where they would buy 160 acres. Here, they would live off of the land in seclusion. Now, around this time, Israel was like three to five years old. Keyes was the second of 10 children. So now here's another thing that I thought was interesting about the way that they were growing up in this lifestyle. They had no heat, no plumbing. They would live like this for seven years. Like there was no TV, no radio. The kids had little to no friends. They were homeschooled. The father, Jeff, was working to build a home for them, but he was doing it single-handedly by himself. 
Now, it, it was alleged that even Israel's toes ended up being disfigured from wearing shoes that were too small. And he would have to like basically become the man of the house when his dad, Jeff, went off to work. Now, apparently his mother had convinced herself that like the kids love living like this in the whole nine yards. To me, what it sounded like in reading it is that this is probably the way that she and Jeff enjoyed living. And I'm sure maybe some of the kids at a certain time enjoyed this, right? Because I mean, that can be fun. And a lot of people are, you know, the, choose to live this way now like they want to do this off the grid that kind of thing but that doesn't mean that their kids like it too right and so i think that it did definitely take a psychological toll on some of them but i think it definitely formed and shaped a lot of israel's way of life and way of thinking but i also think unfortunately and sadly it helped him and what he would later do to other people and how he would get away with it and being able to live off the land and do that kind of a thing. So now a few things that I read in the book and in some articles that I was like, my little sofa antenna is going up over this one is it, some of his behavior when he was younger because so often we see this kind of stuff in these cases, right? And so he would break into houses with a friend. And one time he said that him and this friend were in the woods and Israel shot an animal. And apparently like, this friend was like not cool with his right? Uh, I mean, who would be, right? So he apparently, meaning Keys, would do the same thing to one of their own cats in front of one of his siblings in the woods. Now, we, if you follow true crime, you know this is a major red flag, right? This is not a good sign when you're harming small animals and whatnot, right? So there's that. Now, apparently when Keyes was around 15 years old, he started building his own cabin and he would move into it when he was 16. So I think that also is very telling, like that need to separate from the family, that need to be alone, but also the ability to accomplish that and do that. I mean, that's a major task right there, right? But now here's the other thing that's kind of freaky, right? During this time, Keyes would master hunting animals and someone might think, oh, wow, that's great and dandy. You know, what a wonderful thing to have done. Well, for Keys, mm -mm, no, he was going to take it one step further. And as you can imagine what I'm about to say, he would start hunting people. Now, what he would do is he would basically be like, you know what? I am going to, like he would see somebody, whatever, and he would basically start tracking them. They would become his focus. And like unbeknownst to this person, he would track them for hours in the woods. And this will become more prevalent like later on because remember with Keys, no one truly knows how many victims this man had, right? There's a guesstimate about it. That I think it's like 11 or whatever. We'll get more into that later. But no one truly knows. Like they know some of the stuff that he confessed to and whatnot. And they can like, you know, connect the dots type situation. But again, nobody truly knows. And so these things that he's talking about, some of the stuff that happened in and around the areas, you're like, oh my God, there's no telling how many lives this guy took, how much harm this guy caused on the general public. Now, this is one of the places that I think it's important to pause and kind of look at the family dynamic and who they were kind of dealing with, some of their dealings with churches and whatnot, because again, I think this is also going to be a key factor in shaping who he was to become. So when Keyes was like around 12 years old, this is when his family would kind of give up on the Mormon religion and they would start attending a new church named the Ark. Now, this is going to also become prevalent because when we start talking, we're going to now about some of the people that the Keys were hanging out with and in turn Israel and whatnot. So according to an article uh, in the Intelligence Report, which is published by the Southern Poverty Law Center, Israel attended a really extremist sounding church with his parents as a child. So the Keys family lived near and were friends with the Kehoe family and attended a church which then was known as the Ark. We just talked about that uh, at the time. Time, but then it went by the name of Our Place Fellowship. Now, this place was headed by a pastor named Dan Henry, and they would also attend another church named Christian Israel Covenant Church, which was headed up by Dan Henry's neighbor and friend, Pastor Ray Barker. Now, that's like a whole bunch to swallow right there, but in essence, here's the thing. If Southern 
Poverty Law Center is talking about your organizations or your family and stuff, it ain't good, okay? Okay, it ain't good, okay? So, <laughs> let's just leave it at that, right? Um, it's giving, handling rattlesnake vibes, lots of that kind of stuff, right? So, that's going on there. Okay, so remember the friends we talked about in a, a minute ago, the Kehoe's? Well, if the name sounds familiar, it should, and I'll tell you what. Okay, so Israel was hanging out. Their sons are called Chevy and Cheney. Israel was hanging out with them. So let's talk about them for a second. So according to Southern Poverty Law, Chevy wanted to be like this big enigma Aryan warrior kind of a dude. And I'm going to quote them now. Uh, according to them, he is tied to more acts of domestic terrorism than any other right wing extremist arrested in the United States in the last decade. Again, that is quoted from Southern Poverty Law Center. Now, again, I'm going to also read another quote about them. And again, this is coming from Southern Poverty Law Center, the full articles down below. As the alleged founder and leader of the so-called Aryan People's Republic, he is accused of involvement in five murders. The attempted murder of several police officers, bomb making, armed robberies, burglaries, and selling stolen property. Among other attacks, he allegedly pipe bombed City Hall in Spokane, Washington. So yeah, there's a lot going on there and it's a lot that's not good. Now, now so in regards to his brother, I'm going to quote another article. This came from Salon.com. So here we go. Pastor Barker married Cheney, Coey, and Tana Wilborn, and later facilitated Cheney Kehoe's 19, 1997 surrender to then Stevens County Sheriff Craig Thayer, who acted as an intermediary for the FBI. Cheney Kehoe sought by the FBI after shooting at police in Ohio. Later provided information that led to the arrest in Utah of his brother, Chevy, who subsequently was convicted of murdering three people in Arkansas. There's a lot going on with these two, y'all. Okay, a lot of stuff going on here, right? So they were childhood friends with Israel and they remained friends throughout their teenage years. So do with all that what you will and again what i'm getting at with all this and kind of going over this childhood years and these friends and these influences and all this kind of stuff is just painting a picture of where we saw him going and coming from what he was around what he saw every day what he participated in what was a normal thing to see him going on and so i think when you're seeing this kind of background stuff going on of these thoughts these processes living off the land which i mean that's obviously not bad or anything but the dynamic specific to his situation i think it was all adding up to this you know being excluded from society having all this kind of stuff being able to also formulate these ideas and ways of thinking that enabled him to just randomly take people's lives have absolutely no concern for life and be able to get away with it for as long as he did so the family would bounce around like this from coast to coast state to state this kind of a thing so what we're going to do is we're going to kind of fast forward a little bit to get us to a particular place in time and the time that i'm speaking of is when at a certain point uh, when the family was kind of around the new york area they would end up going to Maine and they would move to kind of an area where it was mostly an Amish community now Case would end up kind of staying back in the New York area there's a plot of 10 acres that he would continue to own there would be a cabin on that and the family would move there they would move to this area in Maine where it's mostly Amish people like I just said and I thought that this was interesting, honestly. You know what it reminded me of is when you watch these shows uh, where these people go to buy homes and stuff and they, you know, the couple's buying this like $10 million homes and it's like, what do you do? And they're like, well, we decide paint colors. This was like one of those things where I'm like, how do you end up doing that? But anyways, so what the family was doing is they were gathering sap and this would be used in the production of maple. And I was just like, oh my God, that sounds so interesting. So all that being said, at a certain point, is Israel, who has always been this very obedient, you know, going by his parents thing, very, you know, into this whole religious stuff and all that, he is going to basically draw a line in the sand and he's going to be like, guess what? You know, this whole thing of all this religious stuff and da 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 da, you know, I ain't down for it anymore. And he would lay his claims of atheism out on the table. Now you can already imagine how this would go over. Okay, it didn't go over. Okay. So what would happen is this is like a lead balloon basically right especially with the father so this would cause major drama between the family and so basically what would end up happening is a a good old-fashioned shunning to be quite honest so the the father was like no absolutely not 
to tell the siblings don't have anything to do with him. We are he, we are done with him. Do not talk to him any of that. Now, interesting enough, and when you see these situations go down, and I guess it's just one of those things where you always, at least for me, I'm just like, at the end of the day, I'm like, well, did the mother still talk to them or whatever? Because I guess I look at it like there's a different bond between mother and child, I guess, than a father and child. I don't know why I think that, but I just think that. But anyways... So the mother would, in this situation, continue to remain close with Keys. That being said, this to me was another one of those major moments in his life that I think was pivotal, it was defining, and it would help form a trajectory. All right, so again, let's do a little bit of a time travel and let's talk about Israel's military career. There's a couple of different things, well actually one main thing in this that I think, wow, that's really interesting. Uh, and we're going to talk about that. So I'm going to put some pictures up as we discuss this and whatnot. So Israel served in the U.S. Army from 1998 through 2001. And these are the places that he served. Fort Lewis, Fort Hood, which we will talk about. And he did about six months in Egypt. Okay, now if you have followed me here at the Sofa Squad, you know that a while back, we kind of have dug into Fort Hood and all the going-ons there. Specifically with a case that came out about Vanessa Guillen. Now, Vanessa met a tragic end at Fort Hood. Her untimely death took place inside of an armory at Fort Hood, Texas. This was back in April of 22nd, 2020. Now, she was bludgeoned to death by another soldier. His name was Aaron David Robinson, and he ended up taking his life. Uh, his gal pal girl, she ended up surviving, and she is, you know, going to stand charges for helping and assisting in this. So that case, for a lot of the public who didn't know any of the going on, and stuff like that blew the lid off of floor for a hood okay i had no idea at the time that like this was like par for the course at Fort hood right that this kind of stuff was going on systemic abuse all this kind of stuff right and so again a lot of times here at the civil squad i try and look for silver linings vanessa's case literally brought to light so many injustices and wrongs being done and literally is making change happen right so okay if something had good had to come from that there's that again it's tragic that she had to lose her life for it right um but it, her her life has brought voice to a lot of issues and a lot of victims voices so that being said when i was reading about israel and his time in the military and whatnot and we're going to talk in the army we're going to talk about it because he actually you know he was very decorated he got a lot of like awards and medals and stuff like that but when i saw that he served some time served some time you know that he was stationed at fort hood i was like wow how interesting now mind you this was you know a hot minute ago right who knows what the atmosphere was? Who knows what was going on during that time? So, who? I mean, it, literally just looking around now where it's normal for bodies to be found, this and that. Now, I'm not trying to sit here and say, oh, he's responsible for A, B, and C, right? But I'm also, what I am trying to say is that we can see what's been going on there for who knows how long. So again, what he saw that was normal, what he was able to get away with potentially that we will never know, and what was just, you know, normal reality for him, I think could have also been forming the trajectory, forming what we came to know as this case of Israel Keys along the way. So some of the awards and decorations that he received were the Army Achievement Medal, Army Service Ribbon, Marksman Badge with Rifle Bar, Expert Infantryman Badge, and Air Assault Badge. So remember how he talked about earlier where he had like mastered hunting, you know, and he would be like, you know, tracking people in the woods and doing this kind of stuff. So when you look at all that, and then you look at like all these badges for like, you know, the, the expert, you know, marksman badge with rifle and all this kind of stuff, you start really getting into like some creepy stuff where it's like, this dude was like, he knew what he was doing, right? This is just a, a whole mixture of, you know, the perfect storm for evil and bad stuff to come, right? So again, this is just one of those things where I just, you see the train wreck coming, not at the time, but looking back now, you just see it forming and you see it coming. Now, one thing that also reading about his time in the army and this life for him is it sounds like this time in his life, he was exposed to 
basically the world and life. Remember, he was coming out of this incredibly sheltered world. I mean, this is somebody who lived off the land, was homeschooled, extremely sheltered, extremely, you know, a, a hardcore religious belief, families, this kind of a thing being shunned by his parents in the end of it for coming out as an atheist or whatever. So there's all that. So he gets into the army. You can only imagine, right? I mean, you see these shows about, you know, whether it's the Amish kids who get to go out, you know, and be wild for a year or whatever it is, or, you know, the story in high school, the overly sheltered kid who finally gets out of high school and they go buck wild the whole nine yards, right? So this to me was his experience with the army. He got out into the real world and it was like, whoa, so he was into drinking, he was into drugs, he was listening to popular music. Now, a lot of this stuff is things that many of us as teenagers, I mean, this is just typical teenager, not typical, but you know, things that a lot of people experimented with as a teenager. And so he gets out in the real world and starts doing this. And so he's jumping into some of the stuff. I mean, again, even like music, he hadn't even heard, been able to listen to at this point, right? So I can only imagine that it was just a wild, wild world out there. And all the while, you have to also think that it's forming these beliefs that he has about society, about the people. It's not good. Anyways, seeing all this kind of stuff go on was completely against his family standards, right? I mean, this went against everything he was taught. So, he's out here. Now, y'all, he's trying coke, acid, drinking, all this stuff. Now, one way I should say that he played this off with his army buddies and stuff is he would tell people that he used to be Amish. Okay, so that paints you a picture. This is how sheltered he was. He had to, it was, he had to play off being Amish for people to buy how sheltered he was, okay? That's how serious it was. Now, he was doing all this experiment, all these drugs. Apparently, drinking was his thing. That's what he took a liking to. The drugs didn't really do it for him, but the drinking is what got him, one should say. And a lot of the people who served with him and whatnot, they would say they remembered him as often being drunk. He was kind of withdrawn during her service. And apparently wild turkey was one of his favorite drinks. And he basically sounded to me like the weekends. It was like weekends were made for fun for Mr. Keys. And he went off the damn hook. Okay. Now eventually Keys would get a DUI for this. Uh, he would end up paying a fine and doing all this kind of stuff for it. So it wouldn't like completely blemish his record in the military or army or whatever um so there was that in 2001 he would get an honorable discharge and this is when he would relocate to nia bay washington okay so let's spend a little bit of time talking about israel's love life i know get the service he bought out to sum it up, if he was on Facebook, we would 100% be checking off the It's Complicated, okay? So what we're going to do is we're literally going to stick to the parts that stuck out to me, some bullet points for this. And what I want to do is to arrive at one of the first cases that... And when I say the first cases, we're going to talk about several cases. There's a couple of confirmed ones. Obviously, if you're watching this and you're familiar with this case, you'll know Samantha. That name will ring a bell. And that's going to be the first one that we arrive at. And one reason that I want to start with that one is it's obviously the one that kind of did him in, right? It's the spookiest one to me. But it's also one of the ones that when you learned about his love life and you hear how what he did, number one, to the poor woman, Samantha, from the coffee shop, and how it integrated in with his, you know, his normal life, right? And how he kept this dual life going. It literally just shocks me, right? So anyways, let's get to that by discussing, you know, what was his love interest? Who were his love interests? That kind of a thing. Okay, so during the whole army thing and all that, Keyes was actually engaged to a woman. And in her world, she was thinking, okay, well, we're engaged. We're waiting till marriage to do the deed. You know, we're doing the right thing. And so that was like a true statement, at least for half of the relationship, meaning one of them. And it won't. Israel. Okay. So he was doing his own thing, right? She was thinking, you know, like, yep, we're, we're, we're going to get married and we're not having sex this whole nine yards. Israel was out doing God only knows what. Now he was out looking for other women. He was out with women. Now Israel was also bisexual. Now in the stuff that I was looking through and reading and researching, this was like a huge thing because it was almost like you would see in some forms where it was like, well, was he gay or was he this or was he that? 
much to f true form with Israel, you can't really pinpoint him into anything, right? And so the argument was made like, well, what do you think he was? And I mean, I just don't think he was anything. I don't think you could really identify him as something. He was nothing and he was everything, right? But definitely he was not just into women. He was not just into guys. It was like he was into everything, right? And he would speak to this in some of the interviews that he did with the FBI. And one of the videos, it's like going to be a separate one because if you're still watching you're probably realizing that this is going to be a multi-part one at this point but he will allude to this right now he would admit to meeting with male well prostitutes and he would get caught by girlfriends with you know looking into like both you know well i curious and homosexual pornographies um he would hook up with guys off Craigslist and this would get found out. He would get caught. And so, and he would say, you know what? You can tell what I'm into by my porn collection, right? I mean, he had all, he was into a lot of different stuff any which way, as Frida Black would say from the Staircase trial, okay? So he was into a whole bunch of different things, right? He really just could not be contained in that way uh, to each their own, right? So there was that going on. Now, so he has that going on. So again, you have all that, right? And this woman thinking that they're waiting to, you know, have sex before marriage or, you know, waiting to get married before sex and you have all that, right? So I'm just like, oh my gosh. Yeah, so poor lady. Anyways, during this time of the engagement, he would meet a woman named Tammy. Tammy is a pivotal point for him, right? Now, she was 10 years older than him. Than him. She already had a child. She lived near his base in Washington. They would have this hot and heavy affair. It would end up a result in her getting pregnant. Keyes did not want her to get pregnant, or I shouldn't say that. He didn't want her to go through with the pregnancy. However, Tammy was like, she thought about it. She was like, no, I want the baby. I want to keep the baby. So she tells Keyes, she's like, you know what, just forget us. You know what, forget you ever knew us. She's going to go on with her life and just move along. So, which was one of the smartest things she could have done, right? Unfortunately, it didn't stick that way. So, Keyes is like, okay. So, he ends up having a change of heart, though. He ends up breaking it off with his fiance so he can get back with Tammy. She ends up, sure, great, awesome, let's do this family thing. But unfortunately, things weren't all perfect in their perfect world. Keyes would continue to put a lot of alcohol away every night. Remember his whole stint in the army, what he was doing there. I mean, this is all during that time. Um, Tammy would have her own issues going on. She would be diagnosed with uterine cancer. She would have to get a hysterectomy. And during this time, well, first of all, their daughter would get a really bad respiratory infection at eight months old. You know, her and Israel would fight a lot. There was a lot of stress going on. So when Tammy got this surgery or her, you know, hysterectomy, she would be given pain pills, you know, obviously to deal with the pain and whatnot. So she would become dependent on these. And this would become, to me, the way I felt like reading it is like, this was like a pathway to a downward spiral for her, right? She would become dependent on them. And the keys would eventually end up kind of acting like almost like a, a, a single parent, right? She would become more withdrawn from the family, more, you know, dependent on these pills and kind of just you know that life right and he would act like a single father or whatever and eventually keys would take the daughter and he would move to another house on the reservation and this is during a time well i should say this later he would meet a woman named kimberly kimberly is the traveling nurse kimberly is who he would be with when the whole situation with samantha samantha is the victim we will be going into a greater discussion with or about here in a few minutes. Before we talk about her, let's finish the conversation up about the transition from Tammy to Kimberly. So like I said, you know, Tammy's not doing too well. He's seeing Kimberly, he's doing all that kind of stuff. Now from what I understand, from what I read, the vibe that I got is that Tammy didn't take smack off of Israel, right? So if she felt like he was going around, she was gonna be call him out on it. She was gonna be the type to be like, what's in your phone? What's the, you know what I'm saying? Like that kind of a person. And so to kind of snoop around or whatever. So that's going on there. Now, eventually, remember, she's, you know, kind of withdrawn. She's become dependent on these substances, that kind of thing. So she will eventually get in a car wreck. And this is kind of like a, 
it, it, it's it, it's a pivotal point for her in this you know trajectory that she's on. She ends up this you know has repercussions from it, right? And so there's that. She does have to end up doing some rehab stuff like this. Well, at one point, you know, she knows about the Kimberly thing and all this, and she'll eventually even confront Kimberly. She'll go to her work, leave this nasty letter, doing all this kind of stuff, and you know she's so there's that. Now remember. Keys has their daughter, meaning her and Tammy's daughter. And so she'll come around to see the daughter and whatnot. And she will be like, well, look, you know, I want to get custody. I want to do this. I want to do that. And Keys will kind of use the daughter in a sense to be like, well, look, you know what? If you want to see her, if you want custody, if you want this or that, you're going to have to get sober. You're going to have to do this. You're going to have to you know, uh, get your shit together, basically. And so she will end up doing this. But also keep in mind during all this, you know, Keys is, you know, going out with this Kimberly person. Well, she will end up moving to Alaska for a job. Remember, she's a traveling nurse. She does a lot of traveling and whatnot. Now, I'm imagining that something like this would be a little bit more appealing because if you're someone like Israel Keys who's doing a lot of traveling yourself, a lot of murdering and stuff yourself and the crimes, and you're going out with someone like Tammy who is going to question your every move and question what you're doing and not just go along with stuff. And then you're seeing somebody like Kimberly who lives, you know, number one, there's some distance between you. Number two, she's a traveling nurse. She has all this other stuff going on. She's not doing, you know, she's not doesn't have her own set of issues, right? So he has that distance to be able to get away with stuff. You know what I'm saying? There's that appeal. So when Kimberly ups and moves to Alaska, Keys is like wanting to follow her, right? And he eventually will. And so this is where a new life will begin for him. But in a sense, not really so much a new life that is good, like a new start, but a new start where he will be able to continue getting away with things. But also those very things will begin to cave in on him and bring to light an entire life of crime that he has been doing beneath the surface. Okay, so now that we have like a palette, if you will, of the background information, what I want to do is to move forward into one of the cases that is what I consider to be when people say Israel Keys, they think of this case, of this victim, of her story. And I want to start with this one because in a sense, this was like his last thing, but it was also the the case the person the voice that like blew his cover right and kind of unearthed this absolute monster that we've come to know as Israel Keys right and so I want to talk about her and to kind of finish this video out talk about the case some of the uh, you know aspects of it that we all have come to know some of the video footage and whatnot so her name was samantha now she was only 18 years old and like i said she was actually his last victim but she would be the one in the sense that took him down if you will now samantha was working in a coffee kiosk <clears throat> pardon me she was working in a coffee kiosk this was in anchorage alaska and this was on february 1st 2012 he would kidnap her from the place from the kiosk Okay, now I'm going to put some footage up here to play while I kind of talk about some of this. Here's my thing with this, y'all. This is one of the reasons why I say that this case still haunts me. Whenever I look at this footage and see this, I mean, y'all, this is every parent's nightmare. This is every teenager's nightmare. This is every person's nightmare. Now, once this footage was retrieved, right, it was completely terrifying. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that's like, well, at first we thought this, and at first we thought that. You know, at first when this was viewed, it was like, well, we didn't think anything of this, you know, because they were kind of talking for such a long time. He was standing out there. Um, but then as it unfolded and the footage kept going, it was like, oh, whoa, wait a minute. This is what really happened. So we're going to kind of talk about it from two different perspectives, right? Okay, so a little before 8 p.m., Israel approached the, the kiosk. He points a gun at Samantha and he tells her that it's a robbery to turn the lights off. And then he bounds her hands. And this is when he jumps to the windows and he will lead her to his truck. And this is where he'll take her to his home. Now, in order to keep her calm, collected the whole nine yards, the whole way, he will tell her that this is for a ransom. Like, just go along with what I'm doing and, you know, all will be well. Now, in a minute, we're going to talk about his version of it because it gets even creepier uh, because you actually are able to see now of course we know what really happened to Samantha 
the absolute just train wreck that was on its crash course and she probably was just going along with trying to hopefully just be like you know what this is awful but i'm going to get out of this as i just do what he says having no idea of that absolute monster that had gotten a hold of her israel would take her cell phone her debit card and for as smart as the guy was and as much as he got away with these would be the things that undid him now he would take her back to the house this is the house remember that he is sharing with kimberly and his daughter he would tie some uh, by her neck he would tell her all the things that he was going to do to her which obviously were not good and then he would check on his girlfriend his daughter and then come out and do said things now on a truly morbid note and what i think paints a picture of the absolute just level of monstrosity that inhabited this creature i even don't like even calling him a man is he would then go back in the home pack bags because he was taking his daughter on a cruise on a family trip right they would be flying out that morning it blows my mind how a person a a man a father something with a heartbeat you know could number one do these horrible things number two then go pack for a family vacation with their daughter I just, you know, it never ceases to amaze me. And again, it's another level of depravity with this case that fascinates me, but also shakes me to my core. Now, the whole thing is, is this case, her story, his version of all this, it gets even worse upon his return from said family vacation. But before we talk about that, I want to talk a little bit more about what was going on on some of the other sides, some of the other you know, viewpoints, her family, her boyfriend, this kind of stuff, and then what Israel had to say about it. Like so many of these victims that we discussed, Samantha was like any other 18 year old. I mean, she had a dad, she had a boyfriend, she had a life, she had hopes, desires, dreams, all this kind of stuff. So she had all this other stuff going. Now her father's name was James and he would end up, and this just breaks my heart, once it was like all figured out, you know, this is not good, she's missing, and he would stand outside the kiosk for hours that next day hoping she would return. She was his only child. She'd even asked him to bring dinner to her that night to the kiosk sometime before she would end up disappearing. Now, like I said, it would be hours after Israel had actually taken her life that she would be reported missing. And again, at first, it seemed like something like maybe she had run off, like something just seemed amiss. And we're going to talk about some of the reasonings and why it came off like that. You know, first of all, when her boyfriend, who we're going to talk about in a second, when he shows up to the kiosk, things were out of place, all this kind of stuff. And as people would see, it was like, you know what, there the money's missing there's a mess here whatever but you know she was responsible and there were people who knew her were like she wouldn't have stolen the money she wouldn't have left the place like this she wouldn't have gone off on her own <clears throat> the kiosk had a panic button she had not pressed it and so these were the things that started adding up that were like huh now also to complicate the scenario she had been fighting with her boyfriend wayne right and this is like right before like all this had been going on before she went missing so this obviously in these kind of scenarios before they get the information does not bode well and completely can steer the investigation and the focus into a different direction. Now, one thing that was going on is Dwayne had her truck and he was going to be picking her up and with the weather and whatnot, that's one reason why they're like, it, it's too, she wanted to just wander off, right? This is too bizarre. It's too cold. Like, this doesn't make sense. So again, let's kind of revisit Wayne for a minute. So like I said, there was a whole bunch of red flags popping off with him at first before they figured out really what was going on. And let's just talk about a couple of those. So like I said, things weren't really great between them. You know, first of all, like I said, he goes to the coffee shop kiosk to pick her up. He sees things are weird, but he he doesn't go inside and when asked why he's like he didn't want to trigger an alarm or something so that's completely bizarre but you know they had their own thing going on right now this part is both bizarre weird and breaks my heart because once we talk to israel or once we hear from israel we know really what was going on so her boyfriend Dwayne would drive back home to james's house he would sit there i guess waiting to hear from her or whatever hanging out well he said that he like dozes off and at like three in the morning or so he kind of wakes up and he's like he just has this urge to go outside and he said that when he does he sees a man with a mask on and he's going through the pickup truck that him and samantha shared and he was like me and the guy we basically like kind of locked uh, you know eyes or whatever and we froze and looked at each other and the guy closes the door and walks away so Dwayne goes back in and he tells James and then like an hour later Dwayne realizes that uh, Samantha's driver's license is missing okay now obviously another question comes up and why in God's name didn't y'all report this and when they were asked why they were basically like well we didn't think that the cops would do anything until she'd been missing for 24 hours 
you know. So, I mean, there's all this stuff going on that is kind of like, okay, this this is this isn't good, right? I mean, it it is what it is, right? So, anyways, so when he's interviewed, and by he I mean Dwayne, he will show the cops like text messages, and he'll kind of like you know, basically it comes out that he's like, yeah, I've been like flirting with other girls, talking to other ones, and like yeah, obviously Samantha did not like that. This was like a source of contention with them, and he'll also show text message evidence that Samantha had said that she needed like space for a couple of days from him, you know that kind of a thing. And so all this stuff is going on with the relationship, right? Now y'all know if you follow true crime if you're in the sofa wherever you know that th what i have just described people have killed for less right okay so you already know this is not looking good for mr Dwayne. okay like he has all these bizarre things i went to the coffee shop and it was all ramshackle but i didn't report it oh a guy came and he was going to the car i mean y'all come on right um and i'm not trying to accuse him of anything because clearly he had nothing to do with it but i'm just trying to really accentuate accentuate <laughs> i'm trying to really emphasize Wait, if you follow me, you know I use the wrong word for stuff from time to time. We just correct ourselves and keep on going. Uh, I'm just really trying to highlight, if you will, this aspect of it because it just throws me for a loop. All those things going on. I'm like, oh, well, I'm sure the cops were just on that, right? Now, if all that wasn't enough, let's fast forward to February 24th. Dwayne receives a text message and it is allegedly, it seems as if it's from Samantha. Now, remember at this point, it's like, like, where is she, right? She's been missing for a hot minute, right? Now, we know behind the scenes that Israel has been on a family vacation on a cruise with her body in his shed in the backyard. So, there's that. Okay, so he gets a text message from Samantha. And basically, this text message is saying, like, you need to go to this park. And, you know, it, it's a a wild goose chase but they don't know this and there they find this ziploc bag it's tacked to a bulletin board and it contains photos of her now the, the photos this is whole part of a ransom note situation that we'll talk more from israel's point of view here in a minute y'all this photo is what nightmares are made out of and it doesn't matter how many times i see it it sends absolute chills down my spine now if you watch me watch my channel you know me you know i have like the horror movie review channel so you know like i mean i i watch this kind of stuff right Number one, when it's real victims, it's completely different to me, right? Number two, this picture, it goes down in my top ten list where I'm just like, oh my god, I I, I cannot. Especially, you know, because when I look at it, I'm just always like, so she had been passed for two weeks. The things that he did to her body to try and make it look alive with makeup and sewing and... It's absolutely mad scientist stuff, right? And so to think that her father, her boyfriend, all these people saw this picture, did not know. I mean, obviously they're going to be like, she looks lofty. They have no idea that this is her corpse of two weeks, right? I mean, another thing, quick sofa sidebar with Israel is that, and he will say this during his, you know, interrogation, things like this. Um... He has no remorse, y'all. He does not care. There is that is completely shot up. He doesn't try to pretend. Okay. The only thing and person that he seems to really truly care about is his daughter, right? That's the only person that seems to really make him feel, I guess you could say. But when it comes to stuff like this, this doesn't register that at all. This doesn't register on his map whatsoever. So this bag at the park, whatever, you know, it contains this ransom note, all this stuff. And there's basically this stuff in there. This, uh, uh, the letter is trying to set things up to kind of play off the scenario. And it's almost like, well, look, you know, she'll be released in six months if these demands are met. You know, I want, you know, money, this, that, and the other. And it's also setting things up to be like, you know, look, they're missing ATM card and it's going to be used in places other than Alaska. He's trying to paint this picture of some form of normalcy. And again, for the life of me, is like good and secretive as this guy was about covering his tracks. This is the thing where I'm like, how did he ever think he would get away with this, right? It makes a no sense. And maybe he wanted to get caught at this point. I mean, who knows? Now, just days later, her dad would deposit like $5,000 into her ATM account. And this was the beginning of the end for Israel, right? So hours later, somebody would try and withdraw like 600 bucks. Then later, one for $500 and another for 500 Now, obviously, anybody with any level of common sense knows 
ATMs have tons of surveillance around them in this day and age, right? So they would go pull the surveillance transactions. Now, here's the thing. He was covering himself up really good for these or whatever, but nonetheless, he was creating this trail. And again, for somebody who's hiding kits all over the country and flying here and renting a car and walking here and doing this and scoping things out, to literally go to an ATM and use a girl who you have kidnapped and killed's ATM card after leaving a ransom note for her father. I'm like, are you crazy? I mean, obviously we know he is, right? But anyways, so a month after the transaction in Arizona would take place, soon thereafter, there was another one in New Mexico. And so, you know, he's on this little spree, right? Okay, so Keys gets pulled over in Texas. Now he had on white sneakers that matched the description of the man in the videos. He had a roll of cash with him. It had red ink stains and paper maps on the seat next to him. Now his vehicle also matched the description and Keys said he was on his way to his sister's wedding. Now in the car, they would find ATM receipts, plane tickets for Keys and his daughter, wedding pictures and, uh, well, turn the volume down, y'all. Adult films with lady boys in it, okay, and all sorts of stuff. That's how they would kind of be like, and remember, and the one thing he said, he's like, well, y'all found my porn collection. You know, he was, as Frida Black from um, The Staircase would say, he, it was any which way with Israel, any which way, okay? He was into hardcore porn. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he was like, whatever floated his boat. Or it's just when you get into killing people, I have an issue with it. Okay, so they found energy drinks, a gun, a cell phone with a battery moved, and inside his wallet, they found Samantha's driver's license. Now, again, I will say this. Number one, thank God he's stupid. Thank God they're always this stupid, right? They eventually get caught with stuff like this. If they haven't gone to Walmart and basically told on themselves by buying the damn murder kit there on video, this is the next best thing. Why would you be in the car, okay? And I'll say it louder for the people in the back. Why would you be in the car with all of this stuff, in, with ink, with r money with red ink on it from where you robbed a bank? Are you crazy? Like, this is somebody who is so full of themselves and is, like, so above the law. You got the girl's driver's license in your wallet? Oh, you're done. You're going to jail. You're done. So let's talk about his double life. So when he was brought in, the record was run, there's like nothing that comes back on this dude, right? And this is another thing that's just completely spooky about him. So let's see that the home address is in Anguish, Alaska. Kind of a fancy area, right? And the home was registered to a Kimberly Anderson. Now remember, we've talked about her earlier. Now she was a nurse and a truck outside of the home had a sign on it reading Keys Construction. So when Anderson was brought in, when Kimberly was came in, like all this is unfolding, right? The complete shock to this woman, okay? Complete shock. She was like, oh, what? You know, him, my little boo bear? No, uh-uh, I don't believe it. Now she even said, look, well, the night that Samantha went missing, you know, he was home with me and my daughter. If you think about it, like whatever your situation is at home, whether you have a shed out back or all that, the last thing you're thinking, okay, is that your spouse, your sister, or another, whatever, is number one out kidnapping random people and doing the horrific things that he did to poor Samantha and then killing them and stuffing them in cabinets and your shed, right? You're not thinking that. So while you might be thinking, oh, well, they're just out of the shed doing guy stuff or maybe they're in their she shed doing girl stuff, whatever, you know, you're not thinking they're doing this stuff so i can see where they're completely like well, no what they're home and it's like unfortunately like yeah but did you watch him every last second because this one you got girl oh he's sneaky sneaky now she would confirm she was like well, look he got up at five in the morning to take you know his daughter on a flight and i ended up meeting them out there a few days later for this cruise so you know all this is adding up and you know the cops had to be like oh my god like, what kind of psychopath have we caught? But there was way more to Keys than meets the eye, as we have already learned by now, right? And so there is so much going on behind the scenes. And so when Keys is brought in for question, when he sits down for the interrogations, when none of this is looking good for him and all this truth is coming out, you know, not only with the events, the nightmarish events, I should say, come out, but we will also learn how methodical he was, how planned out he was. So I want to talk about 
some dynamics of the interrogation. Now, what I will end up doing is a completely separate video to focus on the interrogation, right? So that this is definitely going to be like a, you know, a playlist eventually. But it, what I'm getting at is it will be best if you have watched this and then watch that is what I'm trying to get at here on the damn sofa. Let's continue. But let's talk about some of the things that he said in the interrogation about his side of it, right? Because it gets so creepy. So in regards to the kiosk and how this came about, he was like, you know what? I've been watching it the whole week and kind of scoping it out. And he was like, I decided to rob it. And I felt that like close to closing time was the best time to do so. Now, here's my thing. You think about that kind of time. Now, granted, you know, things are a little bit different in Alaska, right? And I'm talking about sunlight hours, stuff like that. But regardless, eight o'clock is still eight o'clock. Okay. This is not that late in the scheme of things. Okay. It's not three in the morning. Right. Anyways. So now he said that he had no connection to Samantha. Like this is just some random person. He never met her. It's, and I mean, this is kind of his MO, right? It's just some unfortunate person. Now, he was wearing a police scanner in one ear. And again, this is the parts of him that I'm like, this guy is so smart at times, yet so incredibly dangerous, right? So he said he approached the booth and he put his uh, thermos out and asked for an Americano, but he realized that someone was like in the car with the engine idling. So I guess this is when, you know, they, they talk, they do this, whatever. He pulls the gun out and, you know, again, this is where we see her kind of jump back, tells her to turn the lights off. And he says that this is when he, you know, we, they get, he ties her up, he gets in there, he puts napkins in her mouth. And he said that when they left that he found a new Canon camera on the ground and he was like, oh my God, this is like a good omen. And I'm just like, oh my gosh. Now he did say that she would break away at one point when he tackled her. And he also talked about another close call is when they were in the car and they pulled up to a light and two, car, two cops were next to them. They pulled up. And he was like, at that point, I had already like threatened her life and done all this stuff. And so, you know, it's like, look, this is just about a ransom. If you play it cool, it's going to be good, but don't show out basically. And so she went along with it. And that's one of the things that really just pulls my heart out with this one. Because part of me is just like, oh my God, I bet she was thinking, just don't do anything, Samantha. Just shut up. Just do what he says. And this will go away. And it's like, if she had only screamed or yelled, not trying to victim blame her for not doing that. But it's like hindsight, because honestly, I probably would have done the same thing as she did. Being like, you know what? Just be quiet. Do what he's going to say. He has a gun pointed to me. This guy's crazy. He already did this. Who's to stop him from blowing my you know, brains out right here? And he has nothing to lose. You know what I'm saying? So it just, oh my, it just it breaks my heart for her. So anyways. He claims that he would take her to a park uh, where they like almost ran out of gas and he would say that they like smoked a cigar, you know, and he claims that like they shared the cigar and that basically he was like going through her phone and responding to people and acting really pissed off or whatever as if it was her and kind of setting up this whole MO for everything going on. Also, I think it's interesting that he's claiming that they did this whole scenario like that and maybe she, I mean, you never know, like a part of me wonders like the, the writer in me is like what if he said there because you know he was a good manipulator and I was like look let's hang out let's do this you know I'll, I'll we're gonna text these people here have a little you know stogie and she might have been like yeah I'm just gonna go along with us you know what I mean like it's been a long night I'm just gonna this is horrible it can't get any worse you know little did she know so it just makes me wonder what her when I say last moments, not the moments that he took her life, but those moments where she probably still thought she was going to live. Those are the things that haunt my mind when we go through these stories and we talk about the victims. Um, because I just wonder, do they, you know, did they really think they were going to live? Do they know this was their last time here? This kind of stuff. Um, so anyways, let's keep going. Now, this is where he would say that he did, yes, he took her home to where Kimberly and his daughter were sleeping. Now, he would also describe, you know, yes, he did take her to the shed behind the house. He would confirm, yes, you know, Kimberly and daughter inside. So he would describe the same story that Dwayne had. Remember, Dwayne said he went out to the outside or whatever, and he got that vibe to go out, and there was a guy at the truck. Israel would describe the same thing from his point of view. Now, another thing that was just like, oh my God, are you kidding me? Is Israel would say, you know what? Once I got her card, I realized that I left the pen. So I had to go back home, get the pen, go back out. And it's almost like he's talking like, Ugh. 
you know, I had to go to the grocery store and when I got there, I realized I forgot to pick up the spaghetti and so I had to go all the way back and it was a total pain in the ass. But that's how these monsters are and that's why it's so shocking to us because we're like, listen to what you're saying. But again, he doesn't care, right? He could care less. I mean, this is an inconvenience to him, right? Now, and it was especially an inconvenience to him when he did all this and realizes that she only has 94 cents in her account. So it's like, great, I really got a winner here in his world. Now, apparently, when he returned back home, he untied her, retied her, kept the ruse up about the ransom, goes in to check on everybody in the house, and then he comes out, and he will brutally attack her a couple of times. And when I say brutally attack her, I mean in, you know, a sexual manner. It's not pretty. It's not good. This is the time where she probably knew she wasn't going to survive and make it out. He had already been telling her what he was going to do to her and, you know, that he was going to take her life, and now he was actually going through with it right he just kept the whole thing up to kind of keep her calm and then once he got what he wanted it's like yeah this you're gone you're gone and soon after that he would end up strangling her now he had space heaters going to help slow the rigor mortis in her right and then he would clean the scene up he would shower he would get ready for the plane ride with his daughter so one of the questions is what he did with the body initially. So one thing you have to remember is that Kimberly was a traveling nurse, right? So when they got back and all this kind of stuff and he did the whole, you know, I'm getting the ransom and all this kind of stuff. So remember they were gone on a trip. He had kept, the, you know, the heaters going in the beginning for the rigor mortis, whatever. Remember, Alaska is very cold. He was keeping Samantha in some cabinets in the shed. And so he would thaw her body out. He would enjoy himself with her again if you know what i'm saying god help us um and, and all that kind of stuff and so he would take anything that had to do with that evening clothing all this kind of stuff he would gather it all up now apparently what he was doing is like when his daughter would come home from school he was doing the daddy thing and like oh we're gonna sit here and do homework and this that, and the other and, da, da, da. and then he was burning the stuff slowly in the fireplace and whatnot so he was covering up his tracks and doing all this using his firewood so on and and so forth and working on that ransom letter like lining all this stuff up right so that that part absolutely horrifies me that this man went on vacation for a couple of weeks comes home violates her body again right she's been dead for two weeks does the unthinkable to her with his damn ransom photo and then you know is playing dad to his daughter while he's doing this out in the backyard it blows my mind so now another obvious question that we have answered you know was she alive in the ransom photo no she wasn't so no samantha had been dead for weeks he sewed her eyes open he used makeup on her he braided her hair he took several pictures and when he typed the the ransom letter he would keep latex gloves on the whole time to help keep his tracks so then like another thing is well like, where did he put her body well this is what he did with it so he would pretend to go fishing and he went and found a place he saw the hole in the eye set their little thing up like they do and then he would bring back her remains and he would weight them down in the hole and he would actually take the time during all of this to go to a parent teacher conference which again just absolutely shocks me now eventually dive teams would discover her body parts in these incredibly icy waters and whatnot um but yeah he was just coming and you know dismembering her and putting her down there fishing doing the whole nine yards and i'm just like oh my god this guy is just again he has absolutely no human feelings he does not care whatsoever at all right so this is what happened to samantha and again my heart just breaks for her family her loved ones and obviously her what a horrible way to meet your demise now what i want to also do with israel is on the next video what i want to talk about is another known case of his the couple in vermont but i also want to talk about because remember this guy's completely mysterious he took his life before anything could happen i want to look at some of the other potential cases some of the things that he alleged to have done and whatnot i also want to look at the boca murders because those were allegedly possibly tied to him and I was actually living down there when that happened it was this completely scary thing and so when i got into this case i was like oh my gosh what if it was israel israel is the boogeyman if you wanted to ask me who the real michael myers is i would say it's israel keys right the things that he's able to do to another human being with no second thought no remorse 
utterly shocks me. And so when I was looking into this, it just seems that every time you turn around and, and undo, you know, or flip over a leaf or a rock, there's some other just macabre, bizarre story about him. So it's honestly kind of hard to pick and choose what to put in here and whatnot. So anyways, um, clearly this is going to be a multiple part one. So I hope you have enjoyed this first part of it, listening to my whole little, you know, palette, if you will, of like Israel Keys and whatnot. And like I said, we'll move deeper into some of the alleged cases for the next video. Uh, we'll also be going, breaking down the interrogation in another video, but like I said, we'll do that one separate because there's, there's a lot to go through with that. Um, and that's it. So I do appreciate everybody for being here. If you're still here, remember, drop Roscoe some little paws in the thing as well as some sofas. And also drop Samantha and all the other victims some heart emojis down there in the comment sections. Uh, for those whose voices were stolen from this earth. Thank you for making this channel possible, everybody. I really appreciate you, and I love you, Sofa Squad. And guess what? Uh, we'll see you soon.